Whenever one suggests that the law of Moses has been laid aside, the first verse you will nearly always hear in response is this one that comes from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Don't misunderstand why I've come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I have come to accomplish their purpose. The word abolish here is the Greek word kataluo, and it means to disintegrate, demolish, overthrow or destroy. The word for accomplish here is the Greek word pleru, which means fill, make full, supply fully or complete. The difference between destroying and fulfilling is the difference between tearing up a mortgage contract and throwing it in the fire and paying the mortgage off in full. Both bring the mortgage contract to an end, but in vastly different ways. Jesus didn't end the law by kataluo, he brought the law to a full conclusion by pleru. He ended it by its completion, which is the lawful way. He paid it in full. And because he accomplished the law's purpose, he made it obsolete. After all, you don't keep paying into a mortgage that has already been paid off, right? Okay, but what about when Jesus said, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. Well then, if the law will disappear when its purpose is achieved, then the question we have to ask ourselves is, was its purpose achieved? Romans 10.4 tells us, Christ has already accomplished the purpose for which the law was given. So yes, the smallest detail of the law of Moses has indeed disappeared. Jesus was saying that the law's permanence was conditional and it could be brought to an end in one of two ways, either when heaven and earth ended or when its purpose had been achieved. It's like when a parent tells their child, you'll sit here all night unless you eat your peas. The implication is that the child won't be there all night because they'll have eaten their peas by then. In the same way, Jesus would fulfill it before earth and heaven passed away. People focus so hard on the first condition that they miss the second and so miss the point of what the verses are saying. Jesus uses the same kind of phrasing in Matthew 24, 34 and Luke 21, 31 to 33. Okay, but what about when Jesus said, Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Doesn't that mean we have to try harder to keep the law of Moses even better than they did? No, we just can't do it. No one is righteous, not even one, and at least a cold, hard-hearted, hypocritical legalism when we try to gain righteousness by our own efforts. Remember the key phrase, the Lord is our righteousness. It is only through faith in Christ and his finished work that we can be considered righteous in God's sight, not through anything we can do. God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. We are wasting our time to try to make ourselves right with God through our own good works. We become righteous in God's eyes through simple faith in Christ. Now some legalists will still argue that Jesus only made the oral law of the Pharisees obsolete, but the written law of Moses still stands. The main problem with this argument is that God never instituted the man-made oral law in the first place, so it could never be made obsolete. It was in a sense always obsolete. It was never useful. It was never God-ordained. You can't end something that was never in play in the first place, in the same way you can't pay off a mortgage that never existed. But what about when the Bible says, All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true. If all scripture is still useful, that includes the law of Moses, right? It must still have a purpose. Now that's correct. Now we're getting somewhere. It does have a use. And Paul defines its use when he says, We know that the law is good when used correctly, for the law was not intended for the righteous. Who are the righteous again? The only people who can claim righteousness before God are Christians through faith in Jesus. The Lord is our righteousness. So the law of Moses is not intended for Christians. Well, what's its present day use then? Who is it for? Paul goes on. The law is for people who are lawless and rebellious, who are ungodly and sinful, who consider nothing sacred and defile what is holy, who kill their father or mother or commit other murders. The law is for people who are sexually immoral or who practice homosexuality or are slave traders, liars, promise breakers, or who do anything else that contradicts the wholesome teaching that comes from the glorious good news entrusted to me by our blessed God. In other words, the law is for unrepentant sinners. Remember, 
The one thing that law can do well is show people the difference between right and wrong. It can show people what absolute good looks like, thereby revealing their sin. It can show them what absolute light looks like, thereby revealing their darkness. It can show them what a good apple looks like, thereby revealing their rotten core. As Paul puts it so simply, the law showed me my sin. The law can't make people hate their sin and turn to God, but it can at least bring them out of ignorance as to what sin is. The law can still be used in a very basic way to show people that they fall short of God's perfect moral standard. But as soon as that sinner sees their sin, repents and puts their faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour, they have become righteous in God's sight and the law's usefulness for that person is finished. Their sin no longer condemns them because Jesus has already paid their debt in full and their hope of righteousness is in him alone. I have to labour this point because I know how many objections there are going to be. So many Christians have been brought up to believe that the law of Moses still binds them and consequently they have reduced Christianity to a legalistic list of thou shalt and thou shalt not. But let me say this as clearly as I can now. All 613 laws are gone. The entire law of Moses is obsolete. It has been cancelled. It has ended. It was fulfilled on our behalf by Jesus. That means even the Ten Commandments have gone. The Ten Commandments were just part of a single, indivisible law that has been ended by its fulfilment in Jesus. In fact, Paul refers to the Ten Commandments in 2 Corinthians 3 as a ministry of death. He says, The old way, with its laws etched in stone, led to death, though it began with such glory that the people of Israel could not bear to look at Moses' face. David Pawson writes about Christian ignorance in this area, saying, I am amazed at how often I go into churches in this country and see the Ten Commandments displayed on the wall. The first church in England that I became a pastor of in 1954 had the commandments up on the wall behind my head in chocolate brown gothic lettering. I decided that the first thing I was going to do was to paint it out, and so I got a pot of paint and painted all over it. There was a great outcry. Somebody complained that there was nothing to read during the sermon. They said that they had to have something there, so I put up a cross on the wall instead. Painting over the law of Moses with the cross is actually a great picture of what happened. Our hope is not in our ability to obey commands, but in what Jesus did at Calvary. And when we understand that the law of Moses has become obsolete, it instantly clears up so much confusion.